so thanks very much for inviting me to, to speak here today. Um, and thanks to the organisers for making all this happen. Um, you know, I'm really happy that this conference is happening. I, I hope it's able to have a legacy that stretches beyond this weekend here. And also please forgive me that, that my talk's in English. So, um, now, I know some of you already through conversations we've, we've had in the past about um, participation and representation on, on Wikipedia. And uh, it's really nice to see uh, those of you I've, I've met again. And I'm also quite looking forward to starting conversations with those of you who I've never met before. Now, I'm, let me tell you a bit about what I'm doing here. So I'm an academic, I'm a geographer, and specifically at what you might call an information geographer or an internet geographer. And so what I basically do is look at the geography of information and ask questions about which parts of the world are uh, underrepresented, who gets left out, who doesn't. And what I'm about to do here is share some research with you that I've done with some of my colleagues, um, Bernie Hogan, Ahmed Mehta, and Ralph Strauman. Before doing that, though, I want to just very quickly give you what I think is a useful bit of context. So I want, I want to just show you this very old map. Now this, this map is from the 13th century, and it's Italian map, it, uh, and it's called the Carta Pisano. And it's important because it's the world's oldest surviving navigational chart. Now, the reason why it's interesting is because traditionally information and knowledge about the world have been really highly geographically constrained. So what that meant was in order to move information, you needed to move either people or media that could move that information, right? So this Carta Pisana, it was made in Italy, and um, what it basically does is show you useful information, or let's say relatively accurate information about Italy, which is this thing, and then less accurate information about um, some of the rest of the world, Tunisia, Zambia, and then not really much else about uh, anywhere else on Earth, and that's because there were really in the 13th century. There, there, there were really stark constraints placed on the movement of knowledge by the media that we had, that were people and ships and, and books. Now, so that, that's the first story I want to tell you. Basically, that, that a lot of the world has been left off the map traditionally. Now, I want, the second story I want to tell you is this one. So, not only have some parts of the world been left off the map, some parts of the world just also produce far more codified and transmittable information or knowledge than others. So what you're looking at here, what this is a chart of, is the production of academic knowledge, so the, the number of journals produced by, by country. And you probably can't read the labels, but the bottom, the really big uh, bar at the bottom, that's the United States, the one right above it is the United Kingdom. And basically those two countries alone publish far more uh, academic knowledge than everywhere else put together. So that's the second story. The, so the point of this is that uh, why I think this matters is because now, as, as uh, we live in a world in which the places in which we move through when we live, this building, uh, the city we're in, it's not just bricks and wood and glass, right? But this place is also information. And so then if we think about the, the, the production of information and the representation of information, those are really crucial things to be thinking about if we think of places as not just solid, but also information. So, the third story I want to tell you is that then, if, if we accept that premise, it's really important to ask, what is the geography of this information? Where is it? Who creates it? What's it created about? And I'm going to show you just a few maps that we've made on this topic. So, before I get to Wikipedia, because I think this is quite useful context. So, the, fir the first thing I want to show you is uh, we mapped Google Maps. So, this is basically what the world looks like according to Google Maps. This is what Google knows about the world. And you can see something really interesting there. We, we, I can tell you about how we did this if any of you are interested. I'll, I'll skip that for now. We just basically created um, loads of half a million sample points on Earth and, and sampled each place. Um, but you basically get a sense that the red colors mean that there's more 
Google knows more stuff about that place. The, the blue means Google knows almost nothing about that place. And you get a sense of this, this uh, massive amount of unevenness in these layers of information that surprise. <coughs> now, it may surprise you, on, uh, when we took this sample, there's more content in Google Maps layered over the Tokyo, Yokohama metropolitan region in Japan than the whole continent of Africa put together. Now, so that, that was the third story, that uh, internet platforms like Google aren't really changing these older patterns of participation and representation that we're familiar with for a long time ago. Now, all of this leads to the, the thing that I actually want to talk about, and which is we have a world now where there's three billion of us online. There's three billion connected people. And th this is just a map of who's online. We made this, this cartogram. The cartogram is basically a map where you resize the country according to the, the variable that you're interested in. In this case, the variable we're interested in is internet uh, population. So a bigger country means there's more internet users um, in that country. So we, what we can kind of see is that there are, of course, large inequalities in internet access around the world, but still most of the people who are online are uh, in, uh, not in the west or the global north, they're in the rest of the world. So all of this connectivity, it, it means that something different might be possible, right? So here we have the uh, head of the International um, Telecommunications Union, he's gone on record to say, uh, this thing that all of the world's citizens will have the potential to access unlimited knowledge, express themselves freely, to contribute to and enjoy the benefits of the knowledge society. This sounds familiar, right? Well, how will people do that? <coughs> They'll do it with a platform that anybody can edit, right? Yeah. But it's not just platforms like Wikipedia that people are going to do this, because the, the thing I guess the point I want to make is it's not platforms like Wikipedia, it is Wikipedia. Outside of China, it, it's just Wikipedia on which we're, we're sort of trying to, to achieve some of these goals. I, I saw a statistic that 15% of all internet users on Earth use it on any given day. And this leads me to the thing that I actually want to be talking about, and that's the geography of information in Wikipedia focusing on the MENA region. So I'm going to tell you a few different stories. So, the first one is one you're probably familiar with. It, again, the, this is a cartogram, I'll explain it um, in a second. So each one of these squares is a country, the size of the, the square indicates the number of articles uh, about that country. So, what you can, let me just explain what this is going on here. This is North America. This is Europe. This is Asia. This is Australasia. This is South America. And this is Africa. And this is Antarctica. So, that's kind of crazy, right? So, what, what you see is that there's more articles written about somewhere like um, the Ukraine or Poland than the whole continents of South America and Africa put together. And what's even more crazy is, remember where I showed you Antarctica was? At the bottom right, there's more, there's more articles, now a lot of them are stubs, right? But there's still more articles about Antarctica than a lot of countries on our planet. Uh, and I think the, the craziest thing that we ever figured out is that there's more articles about places that don't exist, like Tolkien's Middle Earth, than a lot of countries on our planet. Now, remember this cartogram that I showed you? So there's obviously large inequalities in internet access around the world. But these uneven geographies of access don't really explain this uh, amount of skewedness in uh, the, the geography of Wikipedia. I just want to expand on this really high degree of visibility that's afforded to Europe in particular on this map. And so what, what we did, I'm going to show you a series of maps now. And what we did in this series of maps was we mapped every single uh, biography article, so every article about a human being. And the, the, the last one I showed you was all languages put together. This one is just English, for methodological reasons. So this is every article about a person in the English Wikipedia, but in the 15th century. So everyone that was alive in the 15th century. 
This is the 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, and 20th century. So, now granted in this, we are only looking at the, the English Wikipedia, we're not looking at the Arabic or the Chinese or the Hindi Wikipedia, but still what we, what we saw was a really incredibly Eurocentric history, right? That doesn't really reflect notable human beings that were alive on Earth during, during this time. So, I think, you know, basically we, we need to be careful then when, when we think about what it means to contain the sum of all human knowledge, and I think important questions that we need to keep asking are where and what some of these significant biases that are embedded into this knowledge that really plays a key role in shaping how we understand the world are, and then how we deal with it, how we address it, how we fill in some of those gaps. And so because of this, I've been working with my colleagues who I mentioned to ask, I think, what are more interesting questions, which is not just where are these articles, but who's writing them, who can access them, and what this tells us about global patterns of uh, visibility and representation and maybe even uh, power. So, for instance, one thing we can do is we can look at the layers of information over different places in different language versions of Wikipedia to get a sense of who's writing about who, who's creating content about who. So, let me explain what we're looking at here. Um, this map basically shows you the language of most Wikipedia articles by country. So, um, almost, if you do that, you see almost every single European country has more articles in its own language than any other language. So there's more articles about Germany in German than English articles or French articles. There's more articles about the Czech Republic in Czech than English or French or German articles about the Czech Republic. But you don't see that in a lot of the rest of the world, right? So, um, English is the pink color on this map. So any country that's colored pink means there's more articles in English about that country than any other language. And you see French, which is the, the kind of grayish culture, uh, the grayish, uh, I said culture, I don't know if that was a Freudian slip there, but for grayish uh, color that you can see over uh, Algeria, Morocco. But I think it's the, the, the scale of these differences that, that really results in some, again, almost implausible comparisons. So, for instance, there's not only more Wikipedia articles in English than Arabic about almost every single Arabic-speaking country in the Middle East, except Syria, which has more Arabic. Um, but there's even more English articles about North Korea than there are uh, articles in Arabic about Saudi Arabia, <coughs> Libya, the UAE, or many other countries in the region. So the point of this is that not only do we see a lot of information written about the, what you might call the world's um, global informational cores, but even a lot of that stuff that's written about the rest of the world just tends to end up being just a few languages, and often not local languages. Now, so far what, what I've been talking about is where these layers of information that, that, that can augment our world are. But what about who's creating them? and where they come from. So what this map shows you is the, the number of edits that come from a country. So rather than being articles about a country, this is, you're looking at participation here. A dark shade means there's more <coughs> edits that come from that place, a light shade means that there's less that come from that place. And it, you kind of see the same story being played out here. So I think that the, the craziest comparison on this map is that there's more edits when we, when we took the sample, which I think was 2012, there were more edits that came from Hong Kong than all of Africa put together. And then, we can show you this in the Middle East too. So, you can see that there's almost as many edits that come from Israel alone than the whole rest of the region put together, from Morocco all the way to Iran. Now, this then lets us do what I think is the most interesting thing, which is we can figure out, we can, because we can figure out where the articles are about, and because we can figure out where the edits are coming from, we can ask what I think is the most important question, which is who's writing about who? Or, in this case, what percentage of articles about any place come from local people? So, basically, in, in work that I'm not going to show you, what we did was we statistically modeled 
Um, how do you explain the distribution of articles around the world? What explains them being more in some places and less in other places? And the, the, the best predictor we can find, and this is maybe not that surprising, is the number of edits that come from a place. So if there's more edits from a place, there'll be more articles about that place. That's the least surprising thing you've probably ever heard. Um, but even though edits are, are a really good predictor of the number of articles that are written about a place, what we still see is that some places are far more likely to be self-defined or be written by uh, people from that place. And some places are far more likely to be written, by, written about by people from other places. And that's what this map shows you. If you're a yellow country on this map, it means that less than 5% of edits two articles in that country come from local people. So almost everything written about the countries in yellow comes from people from other places. Why does that happen? I think this is one reason. So what this graph has shown you is the absolute number of local edits in, this is just an English Wikipedia, I will read it. So um, in terms of raw numbers, um, let me show you. This is North America, and this is Europe. So, basically in terms of raw numbers, North America and Europe, they, they really drastically outnumber all of the rest of the world. And then you, you can see um, LSEA is Latin America, MENA is MENA, of course. Um, SSA is Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so basically, Latin America, MENA, and Sub-Saharan Africa, especially, only commit, because they only commit a very tiny number of within-region edits, it means that only a small number of edits that would be shaved off Europe or North America could really overpower these tiny numbers of edits happening in these other places. And that's something we undoubtedly see happening. So, and I think that this is maybe the most important graph I'm going to show you, and I'm going to explain what we're looking at here. So, you can see each region of the world is a dot. MENA is the green one at the bottom left. SSA, Sub-Saharan Africa is the red one. LACA, Latin America. Uh, at the top, you have NOAM, that's North America, and EU, EUR, that's Europe. Now, re remember where those are. Um, so, the vertical axis, what that's showing you is the proportion of edits to articles in a region that come from that region. So if you're higher up on this graph, it means that your, your uh, writing, um, it means most of what is written about you is from you, essentially. And then the horizontal axis, so the x-axis, it means that what that uh, represents is the proportion of a region's committed edits that stay within the region. So, in other words, the, the, the percentage of edits from that part of the world used to write about that part of the world. So if you're further to the right on this graph, it means that you're writing about yourself. If you're further to the left, it means you're writing about other parts of the world. So essentially, you probably want to be in the top right hand quadrant, not the bottom left hand quadrant. And there's only one part of the world that's in the bottom left hand quadrant. So if you're, in the, in, if you're in the bottom left hand quadrant, it means that most of what's written about you is not from you. And not only is most of what's written about you not from you, but the contributions that are coming from your region are not being used to write about your region. So basically what, what we see is that only about a quarter of what's written about uh, MENA and Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa actually come from those places. Europe and North America have about 75%. And so that, you know, that, we kind of already knew this, right? Um, but I, I, I think there's, I'm going to skip, skip over this. This just shows you the same stuff in more detail. To show you two more graphs. Now, so far what I've just been talking about is a very simplified distinction of whether something's local or not local. Now, what we can actually do is we can think this through with a network of where the edits actually flow to. So on, on this network, what, what's going on is that the, the thickness of a line, it symbolizes the number of edits that, that are um, uh, received. So basically, if, if a region received most, most of its edits from North America, you'll have a really thick line going into North America. 
And that's basically what we're seeing in this graph. You can see the edits from North America and Europe to some degree, the, the blue lines and the green lines. Those are the ones uh, essentially overpowering, overpowering other parts of the world. And so basically, the, it's, what it's sort of showing you is who's an exporter and who's an importer of edits and where those edits are flowing to. So specifically, who's writing about who. And then I'm going to show you this data in one more way. Uh, this one basically shows you which parts of the world write about each other in, in Wikipedia. So um, we, we get each region a color again. We put the percentage of edits next to the region name. So if you look at Europe on the left, you can see 75% of edits from Europe are about Europe. If you look at North America, you can see 73% of edits from North America are about North America. And then you can look at the Middle East and North Africa, you see 36% of edits from the region are about the region. And then the colored lines show you where the edits from each region go. So you can see that the edits from the Middle East are going a lot of them are going to North America, some are going to Asia, and some are going to Europe. So I'm going to leave this to you guys to explain to me why this is happening. Is, it, is there some sort of informational magnetism that, that, that's sort of drawing people to write about places where there's already lots of content? Um, is, is it that there's kind of a virtuous and a vicious cycle of, of um, informational presence and absences? But I think, you know, we, we, we do know a few things. We, we know that the, these, these sorts of divides that we're seeing, they're not. We can't really explain them away by a lack of connectivity. So we, we see that connectivity is it, it's definitely a necessary condition to, to engage in any of this, but it's not a sufficient condition to engage in any of this. But from what we've learned so far, I think the other things that we know is the other important things that we know about is, of course, having a broader ecosystem of information, having a, a tech literate and an educated population able to engage in some of this stuff, having reliable infrastructure, uh, not excluding half of your population that I guess um, the, the next two talks will be talking about, um, having the internet be a, a trusted rather than a surveillance space, and then, of course, having the critical mass for local language tools and platforms and communities. And I think we often forget a lot of these more messy and difficult things in, in some of the enthusiasm that we have about connecting um, the disconnected, which of course is only ever the first step to achieving some of the, these goals of more participatory engagements with the geography of information. So that, I'll, I'll stop talking now, they're, they're waving at me for that. Thanks a lot. <laughs>